Greetings from Stanford University. I'm Bill Barnett, professor at the Stanford Door School of Sustainability and the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And I'm Charlotte Kramer, a current undergraduate at Stanford studying computer science and environmental systems engineering. And we have with us here today Professor Bard Harstad from the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. And we just had a, a research conference on the political economy of in, environmental sustainability. And Charlotte, you were there. Uh, what did you enjoy about this conference? I think for me personally, there were two key papers, which I was really, really fascinated about. And I'm interested to hear what Bard has to say on this. Uh, the first one was persistence in policy, the case of close referendums. And it really discussed how these seemingly random decisions towards saying yes to one policy versus saying no to one policy persist for decades, if not a century. And then the second paper, which I really loved, was how economic forces drive political polarization. So this idea that as we move to becoming more aligned in our economic goals, we become more polarized in our value-based beliefs. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. And uh, so, Bard, uh, uh, you know, you ran this conference, and uh, and there's a, such a wide variety of, of papers. Uh, as you come away from that conference, what do you think we should pay the most attention to? Yeah, thank, thank you. I think that's a very uh, great question. I think that uh, there are two broad lessons that I think we should focus uh, on a lot. One lesson is that politics really matters. So you can talk about the environmental science and economic uh, economics forces. Of course, that's uh, extremely important. But what one ma major lesson here is that politics matters. And um, to the mention the paper two papers just mentioned, uh, the paper by on persistence by Zach Freistadt Groff at Stanford. Um, showed that if the is there environmental regulation that is barely passed compared to a place where it's barely not passed, meaning that the uh, voter support of these policies is very similar across the two different uh, states, then 10 and even 100 years later, it's 40% more likely that the regulation stays in place where it was barely passed. So politics is very, very persistent. That, that's um, now, that's an empirical finding, not just a theoretical finding. finding. Exactly. Wow. That's uh, it's amazing, and uh, and the that's that, that's exactly a their empirical finding, and it's the open, an open question is what drives this persistence. Oh, and and that's in the United States. That's in the U.S. Okay, because uh, I would expect similar persistence um, in many different countries, especially in democracies where it's difficult to pass laws because of maybe gridlock. Mm, I see. And one um, uh, the the second paper. Um, Solop mentioned by Valdemar Marx at the IFO Institute shows uh, one reason for why this um, uh, gridlock and, and the persistence may happen, and that could be because of par uh, per uh, polarization. And one may think that when two different parties compete more fiercely than before over, for example, income taxes because of income inequality that has been on the rise, one may expect them to converge and, you know, pander to the media voter on other policies, such as climate policies. Mm. But that is not necessarily true, because uh, if uh, the, in the polarization on income inequality leads to more lobbying and campaign contributions, then two different parties may also start to get more polarized on other issues, such as climate change. I see. I see. So it's interesting that the, um, you know, Charlotte, uh, as, a, as a student coming into this, you experience polarization, obviously, in the student body. How did this resonate with your experience? I think, um, for me, this paper was so fascinating because it really did resonate with the idea that we are aligning on certain beliefs, um, so we have to find something else to discriminate each other. So um, what Martz was saying here with the idea that we need something to attract voters to certain pools so we become more and more polarized. I was really, it really made a lot of sense to me at that point. And I think my biggest question or takeaway from this was how do we combat this? How do we, um, how do we ensure that there's also um, a benefit to 
going away from this polarization. Oh, interesting. You know, how do we find a middle ground almost? Because the way that these empirical results were kind of, or sorry, it was theoretical, but the way that this um, paper was presented to us, it seemed almost inevitable that we would keep on polarizing. So yeah, it's a, it's 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 an entry. You know, one of the interesting things about the great research coming out of the uh, uh, political economy area is that as soon as you hear a finding, you immediately want to think of how things might might be improved. You know, so. Uh, I mean, if I may. Um, one thing which Mart said um, as a lesson to all of us, in a sense, was don't frame the climate crisis as a value issue, rather as an economic issue. So reference the increased job, the longevity and energy, all of that kind of stuff. And if you really change it into an economic issue, maybe we can find more common ground. Interesting. Yeah, I think... Um I think this thing about polarization and uh, and the causes of it is very important, as I said, Charlotte. Uh, and I think that some of the other papers on the conference will uh, teach us a little bit more about how we can uh, think about this. But one paper which, which suggests that it's not actually so easy was uh, a third paper by Milena Djerolove from Cornell, uh, who shows that even if voters are observing the same event, their beliefs might not converge. So she studied uh, uh, natural catastrophes, uh, hurricanes, and found that if they are observed by voters who are experiencing them firsthand, then beliefs uh, will depend and how the beliefs will change will depend on whether these voters were at the beginning Democrats or Republicans. Uh, so Democrats will tend to focus more on the possibility that this is driven by climate change than the Republicans. So it's not the case that necessarily all types of information will lead to a convergence in the beliefs. And this means that this thing about polarization and persistence is um, a challenging thing we, that we have to think more about. Oh, that's interesting. And uh, it, it's interesting actually hearing you say this, Bart, and looking at this finding in light of what you were just saying, Charlotte, regarding framing. Because... I, I mean, obviously, the Republicans and Democrats are uh, not different the moment they're born. Something happens, and that happens would probably be the construction of, of frames of reference that make sense out of that information. Um, so, mm. um, I think we should go think more about information, and I will get to that in a second, but I think that uh, let me focus a little bit more about this general lesson that politics is really important because we saw that at the national level where this persistent was important. But also at the international level, there were several of the research papers which um, kind of underlined the importance of politics. Frick Nesche at the University of Copenhagen, he, he, show, he discussed uh, and um, compared different countries' participation and ratification of international climate agreements. And one would think that if you are a big country, for example, US, then there is a strong, strong reason to internalize the impact of climate damage on a large number of citizens. So a general economic theory would su suggest that bigger countries should therefore abate more uh, and should do more to deal with climate change. But uh, Frick Nesche showed that this is not necessarily the case. Um, an example that he mentioned was Sweden versus the US. But yeah, other also when he looks on the data and aggregate, it's not the case that size can explain a lot of the contributions to climate change. So instead, it must be other things like politics. And a paper that contributed to that uh, question was by Pe Fredriksson at the University of uh, Louisville. He showed that the ratification of uh, the Paris Agreement as Frick, Frick showed, is not driven by size, but instead um, Per showed that it's driven very much by political institutions. He compared legal traditions such as common law versus civil law and found that uh, in 2021 it was 70% more likely that a country with um, common law uh, traditions had ratified the treaty. So political institutions, again, is very, very important as we learned from this paper. Um, yeah, I have um, just one question about um, the paper which Frick uh, Nesche um, presented. Um, one thing that he mentioned, I believe, at the end 
was looking at comparisons of sulfur dioxide emission regulations, which are more sort of internalized within nation borders, and how emissions which are very much internalized versus emissions which are spread all over the globe differ in economic responses or political responses. Yeah, exactly. I think that's that could be uh, a good follow-up study, which was not yet in this paper, but uh, but it's a good follow-up study to study how local environmental problems are instead dealt with at the... Uh, successfully by bigger mm-hmm. countries and that is what we would express, expect but but clearly when it comes to climate change which was the topic here it's it's uh, very much politics which is the determining the contributions mm-hmm. i think what you um talk about regarding uh trade clubs and all of these international organizations it makes a lot of sense to me um especially when we realize that climate change is just such a global issue and the emissions of one country don't always have a direct effect on that one country. So it's only when we come together as an international organization that we truly, um, that we can truly make these yeah. trade conventions and all of these. That's a good point. And and um, because the possibility of linking the agreement with other benefits, such as trade clubs, mm-hmm. might be uh, necessary. And the paper by Prakrati Thakur um, showed exactly that. She showed that how trade clubs can motivate participation, not only theoretically, we know that actually theoretically, uh, because it can lead to an additional carrot that you get only if you participate in the climate coalition. Mm -hmm. But also she showed that that was the case for the Basel Convention on uh, Waste Management. So also empirically studies, which shows that the benefits of uh, such uh, trade linkages. Okay, so a trade club is a climate coalition for those who aren't familiar with that term. Yeah, that's a trade club. Uh, so Bill Nordhaus, uh, the Nobel laureate, he mentioned, he talked about trade clubs in a 2015 paper uh, where trade agreement and free trade uh, was offered as a carrot to those who also participated in a climate coalition. I see, I see. So um, that's uh, especially pertinent as we head towards the big COP meetings this year where presumably a lot of different coalitions will either be formed or have a chance to, to reaffirm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Bard, other, other uh, papers, you had a, an incredible variety of papers at this conference all around sustainability, but really taking very different views. Which other ones come to mind? Yeah, and that's a good point. I think that one key lesson that we have focused on so far is really that politics is extremely important. Another general lesson I think was, which was evident after this collection of paper, was the role of information and uncertainty. So um, Lily Sue from Arizona State University, she she showed how different firms who have more information about their own uh, ability to abate. They might want to abate more if they are forced to, if there is a disclosure policy that uh, forces them to disclose. That can clearly and naturally motivate car, um, uh, more abatement. But a voluntary disclosure might not be enough because if you have voluntary di- disclosure, it will typically be those firms who are already abating a lot, who are already good, that will step up and voluntarily show that they, uh, that they are leaders in the field. So again, this uh, role of uncertainty and hidden information and the, the motivation to disclose the, f- uh, the information points out that this is might this might be important at the private level at the firm level, but it will be much more le- important at the political level. So she pointed out uh, a few police implications and also other papers that I will come to next uh, are focusing on the role of information. You know, that seems uh, especially interesting given that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, at the what we typically see, at least in the United States, is voluntary uh, disclosure. Uh, and uh, uh, and it sounds like uh, we might want to rethink that. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, I, uh, that was the one lesson at the, at the firm level. At the international level, it's it might be... Um, um, uh, even more important. So uh, one paper by Liana Strixra at the Fena University in Hagen uh, studied coalition formation over time. And it might be difficult to motivate countries to participate, but if you have complete information, as in her research, uh, it might nevertheless be possible to wait for others to join if you expect them to do it. The paper by Marco Pataglini at Cornell, however, showed that if you do not know 
whether other countries will join and contribute, then it will be even harder. Uh, because uh, because then the temptation and the motivation to contribute yourself will be diminished and weakened by the fear that other countries will not proceed by contributing. Uh, so he, uh, he and um, Tom Palfrey, his quarter, showed that um, if you have a, even a weak international agreement, that cannot force countries to do anything. It can only coordinate countries and contribute to information. That can help because it can reduce the fear of a country that it will contribute alone. So, for example, a minimum, minimum participation level can reduce the fear and this uncertainty. And therefore, it can motivate countries to participate more. Yeah, on that note, um, one of my personal favorite papers, or one that I found most surprising, um, was the paper on the use of subsidy treaties um, incentivizing global decarbonation without sanctions. I think um, in that paper, they also spoke about how all countries would have to contribute together um, and almost create a self-regulated use of renewable energies. Yeah, and I, I agree completely. I think that this type of... Um, uh, so, uh, Jonas Metzger from Stanford, he, he focused on subsidy treaties, uh, where they pay uh, in a fund, and the fund is used to basically subsidize investments in technology. And investments in technology um, is basically one way of reducing uncertainty and information because by investing in technology, we can learn more about how to deal with abatement, like you, how to use uh, and uh, develop more better uh, solar technology, for example. Uh, and in fact, uh, another paper dealt with something related. Ted, um, Ted uh, Locke Temselides from Rice University, he studied also technology transfers between the North and the South. And the finding in that paper, which was a very general and mathematical paper, was that it's, it might be especially important to kind of design a system where the North can act and must act as a kind of a Stuckelberg leader or as a leader so that it will, it will um, motivate, um, uh, so that it will motivate it to subsidize and t transfer technology to the southern countries, which can then in turn take advantage of this new, new knowledge. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So in the north and south, there is the global north, and the and the global and the global south. If I'm understanding. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I found uh, that paper very interesting, just in the way that it discussed the globe and really discretized us into you know the global north and the global south. I was just wondering, do you feel that? we really should split up the world in this sense when it comes to climate change? You know, tell the global north, do all of this, um, do that, and then the global south to just sort of follow in a sense. I understand um, that this paper, you know, argued, yes, the north is more efficient, um, their current production is better, so logically they should be leading the world. But how do you think that would play out? Yeah, that's an interesting um, question. And I think that it also brings us to an interesting distinction between, and difference between the Paris Agreement and the Kyoto Protocol. Mm -hmm. Because the Kyoto Protocol was based basically between which countries? 35 countries who cut emissions, um, mainly Europe uh, and a few other rich countries, while in the Paris Agreement, every country is expected to contribute. And that is challenging because countries are so different. So I think that in the end, because of this heterogeneity, there is no way, way around to by allowing and expecting countries to dif contribute different uh, different amounts and also maybe different types uh, especially when we recognize that some countries have a much more superior technology when it comes to uh, renewable energy for example and it's very important that this technology is exploited and used not only by those who currently possess it mm -hmm. and that i think brings us to the importance of this technology transfers to the south Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, I had run into some really interesting and, and progressive wind turbine technology in uh, in doing some research in in Denmark. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, the, the companies involved were citing the South China Sea as an area that would be especially or the West Philippine Sea, depending on. Uh, how you want to refer to this location, depending on who you are, that's a, what you might call this body of water. But it, it, uh, uh, and yet uh, several weeks later, when I was in the Philippines, 
um, uh, those those areas uh, clearly were yet to be exploited for uh, for these offshore wind turbines, and you could imagine some real gains to technology transfer there. Yeah, and uh, and uh, absolutely, and uh, the role of the information behind transfers and the politics that we emphasized in the beginning of this. Um, or conversation interact. So one paper that really showed the interaction between politics and uncertainty was by Andrew Hultberg from the University of Illinois Urbana Campaign. He showed that when there is a scientific discovery, um, for example, that the ozone layer is um, being damaged by certain chemicals, then he find that two things happen. Firms, first of all, they will try to invest in R&D in more in, in information about how they can use other chemicals instead that do not lead to the same problem. At the same time as they intensify their lobby contributions, so perhaps in order to postpone regulation that could be very costly for the firm. And he find that they, those two uh, strategies are substitutes. Mm -hmm. In the sense, they are substitutes in the sense that the more a firm lobby, the less in time it tends, it tends to uh, invest in innovation. And the reason might be that if you fear that you cannot innovate, you have to lobby instead in order to get uh, to prevent this regulation, the environment regulation, from coming. Yeah, I think one of my main questions uh, from this was, what do you think of this whole idea of lobbying? I know it's a very common thing, especially in the United States. Um, I know that um, Andrew Holtgren argued that it was something that firms would naturally do until they could find a solution. So he used the example of ozone CFCs. But what do you think, how could lobbying in response to regulatory uncertainty impact our solution to the climate crisis? Uh, that's a very, uh, very crucial question because lobbying is many times thought about as bad. It can mm -hmm. be good and bad, however. The good aspect of lobbying is that it can provide information. And as we have talk, talked about so far, the policymakers are many times lacking information about, for example, how costly it is to introduce a particular regulation. And if uh, firms lobby for one, against one type of regulation, but maybe less fiercely against another type of regulation, that is uh, very important for the policymakers to learn. Because then they understand that so a certain type of regulation might be more feasible and less costly for the firms. Um, so I think so. I think uh, so. That in that sense, it can be good. However, there, there are many. For uh, this paper by uh, Andrew that you mentioned shows that if firms expect to not be able to, uh, and in particular those firms who expect to not be able to uh, find an innovation and find a better environmental technology, a green technology, those are the firms that maybe lobby intensively to prevent and postpone regulation. And, and that they are li unlikely doing that, not for the common good, but in order to protect the, their market and their business interests. Yeah, I think uh, that's definitely an interesting conclusion. I love the way that um, in his example, the regarding the ozone CFCs, that the firm does finally find a solution within rd and &E, and then immediately stops lobbying and wants them to, you know, ban this type of chemical so that that firm is the one that rises to the top with this new innovation. Yeah, and, and about lobbying, lobbying um, is, we also talked, used to think about lobbying as something the firms are doing to influence policymakers. But uh, the final paper on the program by Shiran Victoria Chen from Stanford showed that there can also be a lot of lobbying aimed at the bureaucracy. Uh, she studied in China, but I think this is a very general lesson that man, much of the lobbying that we see are not necessarily aimed at policymakers, but uh, uh, but also it might be aimed at uh, bureaucrats who are implementing those policies. And this uh, uh, opens up a large set of questions which economists have many times paid too little attention to. What is the role of the bureaucracy, those who are implementing the policies which are decided on by uh, by uh, the legislators. So uh, how are these uh, bureaucrats influenced by uncertainty, information, and the information provided by lobby groups? So I think that all together, this kind of opens up so many new questions that we are at a place where we have learned a lot after this conference, but there are still clearly a lot more to be researched on in the future. Yeah, definitely. I completely agree.
Well, you, you know, uh, Bard, uh, Charlotte, this has been uh, incredibly illuminating. And uh, what I think we'll do is, is have each of you make a, a last remark. Uh, Charlotte? Um, I mean, honestly, I think Bard has summed it up very, very well throughout this, um, this podcast. The two main issues are politics are very, very important in the modern day and age. And uncertainty plays a huge role in the political economy economics of environmental sustainability. Um, for me as a student, it was fascinating to attend and thank you so, so much for hosting the conference. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for attending. And uh, I'm extremely pleased to the, all those contributors that uh, I have, you have mentioned so far uh, and also everyone who attended the conference. I think that uh, we have learned definitely that politics and political economy is very important when it comes to environmental regulation and that we need to learn more about how that works and also about how different types of information uh, should be provided so that we are approaching a better climate policy globally. Yeah, you know, it, it's as we uh, find our, our world in a sustainability revolution, I know a lot of folks think of it as a technical revolution, but it's clearly an institutional and, and behavioral revolution too, and, uh, and, and we need all of that. Uh, to make the changes that we know are ahead. Charlotte, Bard, thank you very much. And to you listeners, until next time. The Stanford Initiative on Business and Environmental Sustainability podcast series is sponsored by the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Music by Charged Particles. That's Caleb Hutzler, Mike Rock, and John Krosnick.